Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm here today to uh, discuss a book chapter uh, named Using Big Data to Support Public Space Research. Uh, and the book chapter uh, thesis is how to use um, ur uh, data science tools for, to inform urban design. Um, interestingly, um, as much as big data is being used in different uh, fields extensively, it's not so much the case for public space research, uh, where more traditional tools are still um, are pretty prevalent. Uh, Dr. Christian Day, which co-wrote the book chapter uh, with me from the office of the Provost and Tenon School of Engineering at NYU, uh, is an, uh, comes from an architecture background and is also uh, has extensive uh, knowledge and experience with public space research. I come from a data urbanism field. And together we were able to develop um, this chapter to identify some challenges with public space research as well as big data approaches that can help um, uh, tackle this, these challenges. Um, today, for today, I will go through the cha book chapter outline pretty fast, and then I'll dive into a use case to demonstrate what is possible using uh, big data for public spaces. Okay. Um, so uh, big data, as um, all of you, I guess, you know, uh, is generated in real time, uh, comes in large quantities, uh, as well as comes in different formats. Public spaces are, uh, is the main topic of the chapter, and it's also where we all go to relax, to spend time with our friends and family, as well as to exercise. Uh, public spaces, generally speaking, are part of the urban design field. However, because of their importance and complexity, they're also uh, uh, touch upon issue, um, fields like sociology, environmentalism, and urban policy. Um, the public spaces uh, field has been studied for many years now. Uh, throughout the 60s and 70s, uh, there has been a substantial amount of um, literature at this time, uh, when one um, main researcher of this period is William White, uh, which has, uh, is in charge of, uh, who wrote and um, made the movie Social Life of Small Urban Spaces. And uh, at the time, he used very innovative methods and tools, uh, such as surveys and interviews, as well as observations. Interestingly, uh, many of the researchers um, today for public spaces still use uh, very similar uh, methods. Uh, we think that in light of uh, more recent technologies, there is the opportunity to uh, update those tools. Thinking about those methods, we came up with four different uh, challenges. Uh, in, in the current public space research. Uh, the first one is limited objectivity uh, because uh, uh, surveys are um, being uh, very commonly distributed. They rely on self-report and the reality is that people cannot always give an accurate account of their whereabouts. The second challenge is uh, restricted scope. So many of the current uh, research is focused in either one specific um, area or one public space, which not always um, is helpful to understand other public spaces. Uh, the third um, challenge is the high cost in both labor and time. Uh, the reality is that many researchers are, um, in many cases, uh, take a lot of time to train their researchers, have people in the field, uh, conduct manual data entry, etc., which takes a lot of time and money. And the fourth uh, challenge is a derivative of the first three and the lack of temporal fluidity. And uh, generally speaking, um, uh, means that uh, usually public spaces are captured in research a, as a snapshot and not necessarily account for uh, days of the week or seasonality. Uh, in our book chapter, we, for each one, of, each one of the challenges, we uh, came up with an approach from big data to, to tackle this challenge. Uh, I will now transition to discussing a use case uh, to demonstrate the use of uh, big data to study public space. So streets are public spaces. They're not only how we get from point A to point B. They're also how we, uh, where we interact with neighbors and uh, socialize, as well as where we spend a lot of time by default. Um, NACTO is an organization that is focused in urban design. And um, they came up with the Urban Street Design Guide in 2012, where they um, give uh, definitions of what, how to create a successful street. Uh, one of the features that they uh, identify in the book chapter, in, the, in their urban street design guide, is that street trees are important for, to make a successful street, and specifically they're also talking about the uh, big coverage of trees in streets. 
they're specifically talking about how trees can narrow down the driver's visibility, which is believed to uh, make a street safer, as well as to make streets more aesthetic and break down their uh, scale, which are believed to uh, make it nicer for pedestrians. The challenge is that urban designers are not always, uh, are not capable to actually visiting each and every one of the street segments uh, in order to identify the tree coverage. Luckily, big data can solve this problem. Ideally, we would be able to uh, measure the crown diameter of each and every one of the trees in order to understand what is the coverage. However, this data is not immediately available. I use the census uh, tree data, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but for those of you who aren't, it's uh, an extremely comprehensive uh, account of each and every one of the streets in the, in, of trees in, the, in New York City. And one of the interesting variables in the data is the diameter at breast height, uh, in short, DBH, which is the diameter of the tree, and is uh, a very common way to measure trees. Uh, interestingly, there's a lot of research to back the statistical association between the DBH and the crown diameter, meaning that the uh, wider the diameter is, the wider uh, diameter crown is expected to be. And from this, for this reason, I chose to use DBH as an approximation of crown diameter. So for this, uh, for this calculation, I wanted to measure street tree coverage for each and every one of the uh, street segments. And the way I did it is by uh, measuring the, is by finding the ratio, uh, summing over DBHs. Uh, so I'll go through the, the formula really fast. It's actually pretty simple. Uh, so I took DBH diameter at breast height for each and every one of the streets. I summed them over on the street segment and then divided it by the uh, street uh, segment length. And that resulted in what I called STC, which is the street tree coverage. Uh, and that is a score that I computed for each and every one of the New York City street segments. And this is the result of the calculation. And in order to visualize the data, I divided it to five, um, I divided all the street segments into five equal uh, groups, which are also called uh, quantiles, uh, where the highest um, coverage of trees, uh, the top 20% is displayed in blue uh, and is labeled as very high and the lowest um, coverage of trees is displayed in red and um, is labeled as very low. And if you look at the map, you can see some areas with more orange or red patches around uh, lower Manhattan. And that indicates of a uh, very low uh, tree coverage. Um, in contradiction, if you look around uh, Brooklyn near Prospect Park, you can see uh, pretty big uh, blue and green patches, which indicates of bigger uh, and uh, more street coverage. More street tree coverage, sorry. I will now zoom in into Park Slope and Fogden in Brooklyn, which happens to be where I live. And I want to compare the result of this uh, computation with a satellite image in order to see sort of how the canopy looks like. So what I did here is I marked three, loca uh, three locations uh, with three different scores and the respective location on a Google Maps satellite image. Uh, so number one is a very high street, uh, tree coverage. And if you look at number one in the satellite image, you can see there's pretty dense canopy coverage. Uh, the same for number uh, three, uh, which is a medium coverage. And you can see, it's a little difficult to see, but you can see some sparse uh, presence of trees. And for number two, which is a very low um, street tree coverage, you can see uh, there aren't really any trees here. Uh, and the same from the human perspective. Uh, same places, uh, for number one, very high coverage. Uh, we can see that the, uh, crown, the, tr the crowns of the trees are either meeting or almost meeting and pretty good coverage. Uh, for the medium coverage, uh, pretty sparse in terms of trees. And finally, for the uh, ve very low coverage, we see there aren't really a lot of trees, some really small ones. Um, so to sum up this, ex this example, um, here you can see that the use of open data as well as statistics and data visualization is capable of informing public space research. In terms of uh, limitations and next steps, um, op um, hopefully um, there's a possibility to, uh, so there's a small overestimation of tree coverage. However, this is, I um, don't have a lot of time to expand, but this is a pretty negligible issue that comes from the associations of trees to streets. 
And in terms of uh, next steps, um, hoping to uh, account also for tree species, uh, which can refine this relationship and make it a little bit even more accurate between the DBH and the diameter of the crown, um, as well as uh, there's an opportunity to scale up to more cities um, using these methods or similar ones. Uh, just to conclude, um, I want to, um, so hopefully this example has been a good demonstration of how uh, big data can be used to bring uh, both more accurate but also larger scale um, understanding of public spaces. Having said that, um, also wanted to emphasize that throughout the uh, writing of the chapter, we wanted to keep in mind and uh, always remember the importance of also being in touch with, the, with community members and stay, um, in, stay in an in-person in um, encounter in order to create um, more equitable and public spaces that are targeting everyone. Thank you. So I want to start by sharing a story about why data governance and data trust matters to begin with, because these stories don't get shared enough. Welcome to Xinjiang. It's a territory in the western part of China, which is home of the Uyghurs, which is an indigenous group that shares a cultural similarity to Central Asians. Nuzhou Mal is a Uyghur, but like other Chinese, she loves WeChat. She remembers sharing stories. Uh, she remembers sharing emojis, strings of emojis with her children on WeChat. But one day she heard a rumor that the Chinese government was actually tracking her WeChat messages. And then the cameras came. In Xinjiang, the New York Times reported that on one block, they noticed 20 different cameras tracking them as they walked down the street. And these technologies were smart. They used advanced machine learning and artificial intelligence to track and identify people at rapid efficiency. Suddenly, the police checks became more frequent she remembered days where, during the night, the police would come into her apartment and wake her up. These police checks became so frequent that they decided and planned to move. What they decided was first that Nurja Ma would leave while the husband and the children would stay back to wait for uh, the children's visas. But as soon as she left, the husband was arrested and she hadn't been able to talk to her children for the last two years. In fact, on her WeChat, all of her friends and family began to block her, and she had no contact with her life back in Xinjiang. What she remembers was that this was one of the most lonely um, moments of her life. What we have to remember when we adopt new technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning is that there is a balance between the effectiveness of those technologies that we saw here, but also how they might disempower the most vulnerable amongst us. What this shows is that when, with the use of certain technologies, while this is an extreme case, is that it can heighten distrust between groups within that society and within the groups uh, of, of, the, of the public sector. And for instance, in Xinjiang, Uyghurs have one of the lowest amounts of distrust, highest amounts of distrust with the, with the government. I, the reason I bring this up is that it shows us and provides a case study into what the, the types of visions and the cities that we might see here today. It's not, it's not something what's limited to uh, Xinjiang. And one way that this has come into fruition is Sidewalk Labs' is smart city in Toronto. It's been labeled as a neighborhood that would be built from the ground up using all the advanced technologies, machine learning, artificial intelligence. And it was claimed to be one of the most efficient projects, uh, cities of the world, by using technologies such as smart buildings, uh, smart building raincoats, um, heated pavements with sensors, object classifying cameras, and autonomous vehicles. Google is furthermore one of the most influential brands in Canada and had a strong relationship with the quasi-public government um, of Waterfront Toronto. And to boot, it used community engagement to build trust and incorporate input from the public community. Yet, it, surprisingly, it's been struggling. One of Toronto's and Ontario's pri former privacy commissioners and advisors, top advisors to the program, resigned. Ontario actually sacked three members of the board, and Canada's version of the ACLU actually filed a national lawsuit against the project. 
Furthermore, high-level officials said that there would be no way they would sign up on the plan. What happened? They had all the cards going for them, fancy, fancy effective technologies, high-level uh, government relationships, yet they're struggling. What this shows is that there was insufficient work to think about trust, again, going back to the Xinjiang story, trust with the local community. The OECD describes three important predictors in their cross-national surveys and experiments to look at the, uh, trust. The first is this idea of incompetent service delivery. How responsive and how effective and uh, safeguarding is the government around uh, the delivery of public services? Secondly, how, how, how much do everyday citizens feel empowered to make a decision around their smart city? And how do they view the, the level of corruption within the government? And finally, what is the level of unfair economic opportunities in that society? What is the level of health care, of access to social services and housing that exists? All these three things that the OECD provides, provides a fantastic window into what's going on in the, uh, in the sidewalk case. For this presentation, I simply focused on the last point, the third predictor of unfair economic opportunities. In the sidewalk case, um, and again, just to show that there's tons of research showing how unequal access to basic needs, all the way from Princeton to OECD, shows that this is a major predictor of distrust. In the sidewalk case, there was a sense of belief that public resources were going to be used for private gain, especially for a vision of the city that many did not believe in. Additionally, public advocates criticized the project for believing that once sidewalk comes in, they would have a data monopoly, a stronghold, and access to the most intimate sources of data, that is the city, that most citizens cannot opt out of. The reason that data trusts become an important part of this conversation is that it's trying to solve this question of data monopolies. A data trust is simply an independent way to hold data, to structure data, that conglomerates data from lots of different citizens. It moves from this idea of data feudalism that only a certain few, such as the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, have access to data and control the data for advanced analytics, such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, but that we move towards a data democracy. How can more have access to the data that big tech corporations are, are garnering from everyday citizens? And in fact, this was one of the methods posed by Sidewalk Toronto to deal with the criticisms that it faced. Unfortunately, despite the ideals of a data trust, there are significant operational problems in creating one. I, in the research that I did, I looked at lots of different papers looking at the creation of a data trust, what were some of the main themes and problems that came out of it, and what are some potential solutions that we can offer so that this vision of a data trust may become more of a reality. The first of this is this idea that there is a lack of data literacy and skills. Many say that this is the most important challenge in creating a data trust, where, in fact, everyday people, how can we expect everyday people and an independent third party to have the same level of data literacy as the Googles and the Ubers of the world? Especially in light of new data regulations, such as the General Data Protection Regulation, the California Consumer Privacy Act, HIPAA, all these data regulations create a really fantastically complex environment for understanding what people's rights and obligations are. One of the key tools to consider for this, this problem of data literacy is this idea of a policy engine. And what a policy engine comes out of this, uh, the industry uh, of the field of data governance technologies that are coming to rise is the idea to create data policies, protections on these data sets without having to, without having to code. Imagine that, the ability to create a masking policy on highly sensitive data that's garnered from the city by a few uh, drop-down menus. And in this example, what we see is that this data policy was created with, with a drop-down menu. This is the highly sensitive data that was previously exposed. And once that data policy was created on all connected data sources, you can create an irreversible, irreversible hash on that highly sensitive data set across all of your data sets. And tools like this can dramatically help with the data literacy problem that data trusts are ex currently experiencing. The second is complex privacy laws. Again, as I mentioned, GDPR, CCPA, and the slew of data regulations that are going across the world create a really fantastically complex environment for these data trusts. And data trusts may not even, uh, certain experts believe that, can data trusts even use this data? 
There are two key problems here within the complexity of data privacy laws. The first is, what does personal data even mean? What is the definition and scope of that personal data? In GDPR, it can be one thing, and all the way from CCPA in California, it can also include household and device information. And the second is the purpose of that data. This is a key trend in data regulations that say that it's not just about anonymizing and making data more confidential. It's also about restricting how that data is going to be used once it's collected. So for instance, if Google collects data about you and the city, can they then go on and use it uh, to improve it? Uh, so if they're first collecting it to improve the efficiency of the sidewalk, can they then get, go on and use it for the purposes of marketing you or sending a personalized advertisement? That is what the concept of purpose limitation is going at. One key tool to deal with this idea of uh, the scope of personal data are differential privacy and other purpose enhancing privacy enhancing technologies. At its core, what differential privacy does is to aggregate data so that individuals or, or organizations can't get access to individual level data sets and add a little bit of noise to make it mathematically difficult for people to re-identify individuals within that data set. And this is just a very, very simple example here. And again, with a policy engine, differential privacy policies can be created without code. And previously, differential privacy, again, a favorite of Apple's, is something that requires teams of data scientists and software developers to create for an everyday organization. Imagine if a data trust could also use something like this. And then secondly, towards that idea of a purpose limitation, there's the ability to use, again, drop-down menus to restrict access to data based on the data analyst's purpose. And in here, in this case, you could only use this data set if the analyst is using it for the provision of maintenance services. The last point to bring up here, and one of the third significant challenges, is accountability of the data trust. All these individuals, they may be grabbing data from Google, putting into a third-party data trust, and they're just crossing their fingers, hoping that the data trust is protecting and analyzing their data in an appropriate way. GovLab and other big leaders of the data trust movement believe that this is one of the most significant problems. Um, without it, there is the potential to create irreversible harm in believing that this data trust is fulfilling its mandate and creating access to more data in a responsible and privacy-enhancing way. To deal with this issue, and this is not, again, all these tools are not final solutions. There are starts to the conversation around thinking about how we can deal with data monopolies. But one tool is this idea of an auditing tool, a no-code auditing tool. And in a sample example here is that using, again, a series of drop-down menus, you can look at all the, re all the ways that data was being used across your organization and seeing what they were used for. You see the purpose here that John was using Salesforce data for the purpose of checking emails. You can see who's using the data, when they're using it. Tools like this are really critical so that third-party organizations like Data Trust can make sure that uh, there, there's independent verification that they're doing their job correctly and that if data breaches or data incidents do happen, we can go back, see what the source of the problem was, and learn from our mistakes. Just to recap, the three, the three problems I identified from my research is simply, first, the lack of data literacy. People can't code. People, we can't expect people to learn how to use uh, and manage data in a, in a sophisticated way. How can we expect data trust to do so without the technical expertise of the Ubers and the Googles of the world? As a result, Tools like no-code policy engines can play a critical role here. Complex privacy laws create numerous rights and responsibilities around data, all the way from defining what personal data is to creating purpose limitations on that data. Again, privacy-enhancing technologies can help sidestep some of those questions around um, anonymizing or further de-identifying data with, while creating some utility around that data and also creating purpose limitations to make sure that data analysts within that organization is only using the data for the purposes that they're supposed to. And finally, accountability is critical. So um, accountability is critical. So in the end, uh, what we must think about is how data sharing initiatives like this have evidence of need and clear uh, participation. Um, and tools like this are going to be critical for the next wave of innovations that affect our daily lives and in highly regulated industries. So ultimately, the goal is to move fast and to protect trust. Thank you so much for your time. Good morning. I'm Ria Kondu from the Department of City and Regional Planning at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. 
I'm very excited to be here today to talk to you about our research on associating right sourcing use with road safety outcomes, leveraging data from Austin, Texas. And I want to give credit to my collaborator, Dr. Noreen McDonald. In the United States in 2017, there were more than 37,000 traffic fatalities, and 29% of those were associated with drunk driving. Now, several state departments of transportation have established Vision Zero programs with uh, the scope of reducing traffic crashes and eliminating uh, road fatality. So uh, the scope of doing that is essentially um, uh, reducing the loss of productivity, the loss of human capital, and the loss of income at the household level associated with expenses of uh, medical costs and uh, uh, court expenses. And since the 1990s, we observe a downward trend of the rate of fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled in the US up until the most recent years. And several road safety interventions have been credited for uh, this reduction, particularly looking into traffic infrastructure uh, investments and traffic calming measures as well as seatbelt laws enforcement, even though from the recent literature we know that there are policing biases there explored. At the very same time, there are educational programs and efforts to change behaviors that uh, can help drivers become less um, aggressive. And uh, vehicle safety standards and intelligence systems that make motorists more alert while driving. Same thing holds for the availability of more mode options nowadays that essentially get drivers while intoxicated reach their destinations more safely instead of driving home and being at risk to be involved in a, a, a road crash. Now in this work we are particularly interested in exploring the effect of these uh, new options including right sourcing operations such as um, operations imagined like Uber and Lyft in achieving road safety uh, improvements. And on the one hand there is anecdotal evidence of the reduction of driving under the influence arrests in South Florida because of the operation of this type of services. But on the other hand there is significant research that showcases that services like this and operations lead to an increase of vehicle mass traveled in the road network that can then um, increase uh, the probability of uh, being involved in crashes in the region that they operate in. Therefore, in this work, we are using right sourcing trips and trying to understand whether this is a significant predictor of uh, road safety outcomes that we measure as road crashes, injuries, fatalities, and driving under the influence uh, of fence rates. This is the first study, empirical study, that tries to uncover uh, such relationships, taking into consideration actual geospatial data of right sourcing use. And we hope that this way we can inform city planners and managers in making decisions and incorporating right sourcing options uh, in their um, Vision Zero programs. We leverage data sets that are longitudinal, therefore they have both a time and a space component. We use uh, safety outcomes from Austin Police Department, uh, actual X and Y coordinates and time of day units. And the right sourcing exposure is captured through trips, origins, and destinations from the operation of a company that entered the region of Austin, Texas in 2016, where we have uh, very granular data. And at the very same time, we control for total number of trips in the region as origin and destination. But those are in less granular level in the census tract and month level, as well as socioeconomic and demographic data that stem from the American Community Survey. Because of the difference of the granularity of data, we aggregate variables at the census tract month year level. And uh, we uh, establish correlations between uh, the covariates that we use and track time series in order to detect trends over time. 
And then we perform hypothesis testing to essentially test for uh, residual spatial autocorrelation and employ spatial lag and error models to uncover the significance of right sourcing use or um, the, absence of the absence of significance of right sourcing use on road safety outcomes. In order to um, inform data-driven policy, uh, the interpretability of our analysis is much more important in this case uh, than the prediction accuracy. Looking into the crash and injury rates over the years from 2012 to 2017 in Travis County, we observe an um, increasing trajectory of those after June 2014 uh, that coincides with the introduction of right sourcing services in the region. But um, think about it, at the same time there was a significant drop in gasoline prices and significant influx of population in the region, so we cannot necessarily uh, understand the correlations there. At the very same time, we review that driving while intoxicated arrest rates go down um, from 2012 up to 2017. And looking into the right sourcing trips growth over that time frame between June 2016 and July and uh, March 2017 that we have data for, we observe an almost exponential growth at, uh, uh, in this region. And um, I would like to point out here that during that time, the operation of uh, Ride Austin was, uh, was not competing with other major companies such as Uber and Lyft because they have just exited that market at that time, there were, fo there were the only ones in that region. Uh, this enables us to create two groups of analysis before uh, the entry of right, uh, right sourcing and after the entry of right sourcing, looking into the time period between 2012 and 2014 in the first case and the period of 2016 to 2017 in the, l the other case. For the former, we see that the crash rates were primarily aggregated in downtown region of Austin and uh, concentrated in some census tracts close to the airport. But after right, uh, right sourcing operation launched, we observed that even though the rates of right sourcing um, uh, were concentrated uh, in downtown census tracts, the average crashes uh, rates were actually observed to increase in the outskirts, potentially indicating the uh, economic growth of the region and the much needed travel in order to accommodate uh, the, the demand. If we look into um, these two categories uh, without accounting for time and space effects, we will see that uh, after the entry of right sourcing, crashes uh, average rate increased, driving while in intoxicated offenses decreased, injuries increased, but so did the total travel demand and the population in the region. So we cannot get a lot of insights at l unless we conduct uh, 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 spatial dependence modeling accounting for both time and space effects that we perform here. And we are able to uncover the significance of the number of right sourcing trips in predicting crashes, injuries, and driving while intoxicated offenses in the region, and show that for 1% increase in right sourcing trips, we can achieve up to 0 0.12, 0 0.25, and 0.36% reduction of uh, those um, uh, three um, uh, road safety uh, outcomes. So there are potential benefits of using right sourcing uh, in our networks, uh, particularly um, from the magnitude of it, mostly uh, related to driving while intoxicated offenses. But since the magnitude is smaller compared to traditional interventions that are used in this space, such as uh, road infrastructure improvements and calming measures, uh, even though if you think about it, uh, reconfiguring an intersection or reducing speed limits might be much more costly than collaborating with an actual provider of uh, right sourcing uh, services. Uh, I would like to conclude saying that uh, of course it's important to perform this type of analysis in different regions in order to make sure that uh, we have robust outcomes that are transferable. And at the very same time, uh, it's important to pinpoint 
populations and subpopulations that can benefit the most from the operation of right sourcing because something tells me that age, um, income level and uh, employment status might, might, uh, might be important there in order to identify key drivers that can help us maximize public health benefits. And uh, this analysis is done in a specific region in the United States, but it might be much more important to review um, its appropriation in um, uh, places like China, where the density is much higher, the use of these type of systems um, uh, are prevalent. Thank you very much for your time. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jared Webb. Uh, I'm going to be talking uh, to you guys today about how we used machine learning to make recovery in the Flint water crisis more efficient. Um, and we'll give kind of a case study and uh, some historical background. So uh, to start with, I want to explain a little bit about Flint. Flint was once one of the most prosperous cities, cities in the United States. Uh, at its heyday, there were 80,000 people employed in GM factories there. Uh, but since then, the industry has declined, and now there's only 5,000 people working in the automotive industry there. And as that decline happened, the tax base shrank, and after the financial crisis in 2008, the city had to declare bankruptcy, and, uh, appoint, and the state appointed an emergency manager to come in and, like, and take the city's finances and put them on a sound footing. And one of the decisions uh, that this emergency manager made was to switch the water source in Flint from the Detroit supply to the Flint River. Now, the Flint River was more acidic than the previous source, and as it flowed through the metal pipes, it corroded them and uh, led leached into the water supply. Uh, and this went unnoticed for about two years before a doctor working in Flint noticed that uh, many children were having elevated levels of, blood, of lead in their blood. Uh, this became a significant media story, and the city initially scrambled to get clean water to people. They gave bottled water out. They made water testing available. But soon their focus switched to long-term recovery and mitigation, which meant they had to remove lead pipes. Now, which lead pipes are we talking about? The, this is a big question. We're focusing on what are called lead service lines. These have been identified in the engineering literature as a source of lead in, uh, in the environment, especially for uh, uh, children and residents in cities. Um, and so the city wanted to replace all of these lead service lines. However, well, and, and this is an easy thing to do if you know where they are, but they didn't. Uh, initially, there was no information whatsoever about which houses had lead pipes. Uh, eventually, they produced some uh, hand-drawn maps, uh, ironically water-damaged. Uh, and uh, these also, uh, as they were digitized, uh, as we were able to validate these, they were wrong about as often as they were right, a little bit better than a coin toss. So we have tremendous uncertainty um, about which homes have lead pipes. And this is really important because it's really expensive to find out. You've got to dig a hole, a big hole, in fact. You've got to shut down a street to find out which homes have lead pipes. Um, and, and this is you know, very expensive, about $5,000 per, per label, per identification. Um, there's actually, uh, eventually we discovered that there's a, a slightly cheaper way. Uh, well, it's actually significantly cheaper. Um, called a hydrovac truck, which uses a high-pressure water hose and a, essentially a big vacuum cleaner to dig a small hole straight down, and you can uncover a pipe material that way for a couple hundred dollars. And this is where we came in. Um, we worked with the city, and we directed them where to send these trucks in order to get a representative sample of uh, the service line materials throughout the city so that we could build a machine learning model to predict which homes had lead pipes. And as the data came in, we were able to build highly accurate models. So uh, we tried various approaches. Um, if any of you was on a Kaggle competition, you're not surprised that XGBoost did the best. Um, but each, each approach was good. We were at this point, we were at like 0.95 ROC, which is uh, highly accurate. So we, at this point, we've got a pretty good idea. And, and this is really important when you were talking about crisis recovery because of this graph, OK? Um, Costs to replace service lines are an inverse function in hit rate. So if your hit rate is very low, if you're sending, if you're sending X backhoes to dig a bunch of holes to replace pipes and you find copper, that's a huge waste of time and money. And you're spending all of your time digging holes and filling them in again and digging the holes the most expensive part, right? 
Um, but if you are focused, if your hit rate is very high, you can get your cost down and you hit rapidly diminishing returns as you get a high hit rate. But it's really important because of this big blow up we have as the hit rate goes to zero. And I'm going to take my time to uh, Jake now to keep talking. Thank you, Jared. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is, these are maps of the city of Flint. Uh, so our team was involved as early as 2016. Um, they're, they're a little bit pixelated, but you can see there's red dots and there's green dots on these maps. This is the end of the replacement program in 2016. At this point, they didn't have a huge amount of money, so they only, had, they only were doing a, a, a small number of replacements. You can see um, when they dig a hole and they find lead, they, we draw a red dot, and if you see a green dot, that means they, they dug a hole and they found copper. So obviously, if you dig a hole, one of those expensive holes you saw on the previous slide, and you find copper, that, even, that still costs thousands of dollars, even though nothing gets replaced. So in the early days, they only had about $20 million. Money rolled into the city, and I'll explain that in a little bit, um, via a, a, a lawsuit, um, and it brought the total of spending up to $100 million to do replacements. We were involved with selecting which homes got replacements and which ones didn't. We helped policymakers make those decisions. And you can see our model was still doing relatively well. We were selecting homes in the city we believed had lead service lines, not copper. We weren't perfect, of course. You see certain regions of the city they went, and they found, they found copper pipes. You'll notice that in 2018, um, it appears that we're doing a lot worse. You'll notice that uh, there's a lot more green dots in this image. And you might ask yourself, what happened? Did our model's performance suddenly get significantly worse? And the answer is, our model wasn't being used in 2018. Just to give you a sense of uh, how bad the situation was, um, this was the hit rate in the first uh, uh, year and a half, or roughly a year and a half of the, of the project. And then, of course, in, in, in 2018, the start of 2018, you'll notice there's a huge drop off. This huge drop off started exactly when Flint decided to hire a much larger contracting firm instead of the small team that was doing the, making the decisions about pipe replacements before. I won't mention the name of that contracting firm, but if you want to use Google, you're welcome to find out about that. <laughs> so that contracting firm didn't have any data scientists. We sent them our model results, and we tried to get on the phone with them many times, and they mostly ignored our work. And we were disappointed by that. We moved on, we wrote a paper, we got some attention for the project. We were happy. Um, but uh, around about 20, uh, the, the uh, middle of 2018, um, the National Resource Defense Council, as well as several journalists, got in touch with the members of our team. Now, the money for Flint for these pipe replacements came in because the NRDC was the, was the, the law firm representing plaintiffs that were suing the city and state for the problems of the, with the water. The NRDC. Um, of course, was as the, the representing the plaintiffs, they uh, uh, you know were in charge of, of structuring the settlement agreement. When they saw how much money was being wasted in the city, they contacted us and to asked us to do an analysis of uh, what, why was the money being spent badly, what was going on, and why was our model not being used. Um, by the end of by middle of uh, 2018, they asked us to submit an affidavit to in federal court uh, describing what we were observed, what had happened before, what had happened in 2018. As a result of that affidavit and as a result of legal action. The city decided, or the NRDC essentially forced the city, the, the, you know, the city and state governments to use our model again. So you'll notice that, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, there it, so this was, um, this was a, a, an interesting moment. I mean, suddenly, as an academic, I'm not used to being in charge of spending tens of millions of dollars in federal spending, federal and state spending. So this was an interesting experience for us. Um, and you'll notice, if you're curious, what was their performance? How did it change after, at the end of this, uh, this process? You'll notice that um, the hit rate has increased significantly in 2019. And by the way, this continues, and I guess we can probably update this graph every, we can update this graph every month. We're getting data every month from the city as to how their hit rate is. So um, just to give you another visualization of this, um, in, 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 in 2019, this is how we're performing now. This is the cost of replacing 100 uh, uh, lead pipes. Um, in 2018, this is uh, their performance. This is how much it costs to replace 100 lead pipes in the city. If you had simply been random guessing, this is what you would have gotten. So they did significantly worse than random guessing when it came to this pipe replacement pro uh, uh, project. So um, it just as another visualization, again, this was the cost of replacing 100 pipes for the first year and a half. It increases significantly, and now you can see that there's a big drop off. Um, so the, the, the point that I want to make here is, um, is that this is a hard problem. It's a problem that really needs data. And if you're really interested in minimizing government waste, uh, this is something that using data and data science something you should be thinking about. And I'll just mention at a high level that um, we're not the, this is not the only, Flint is just the tip of the iceberg. 
There are cities around the country that are having problems with lead and lead pipes. Um, and uh, you can't simply try to just throw money at the problem and hope that it gets resolved. Um, we've been, um, we, we actually have started an organization called Blue Conduit, um, and we're trying to help other cities do similar things. You may have heard in the news that Newark, New Jersey is having uh, problems that are very related to Flint's problems, um, and we've been you know, trying to talk to them and to other cities about how to resolve these, these issues. Um, so I've been told, I think, thanks, everyone. And I've been told that we may have a few minutes for Q&A because we ended up with some time at the end of the session. So if you have any questions about our work, feel free to. I wonder, um, does that relate to lead paint at all? Because apparently New York has a big problem with lead paint. Uh, yeah, we, we haven't. It's a it really interesting question. There's this question of what is the major source of, um, so, you know, there's many ways you can get lead into your system. Um, one of them is through water, um, but a, a very common method is, uh, is, is from lead paint in homes. And um, it's, it's an interesting problem. It's a different problem. And we, we haven't yet worked with, with, lead, with, lead, uh, with lead paint. Uh, lead paint's a little different because it's not quite as expensive to determine whether you have lead paint or not. Um, but it's, it's quite expensive to determine if you have a lead pipe because it's, it's buried so far underground. But good question. Uh, is there anything that you would suggest we do for our uh, New York City reservoir supply, which is supposed to be, you know, it's, it's good water, but in other words, so that bad things don't happen? <laughs> well, I, I will say that the problem, and maybe Jerry was comment, comment on this, the problem that happened in Flint originally, which would have not created this problem in the first place, is if they had simply used the appropriate corrosion control treatments. It's not, and this is maybe a c common confusion, the water was drinkable that came from the Flint River. The problem was that it corroded the pipes. It would, the, the water corroded pipes, the white pipes leached lead, and then you had bad water at the end. Um, the actual source of the water wasn't a problem, but there are ways of uh, doing con corrosion control, uh, which um, you know, uh, uh, can, can, can just resolve this problem. So I don't know the details of, of how different states. I know that Newark, for example, has been trying various methods of con corrosion control, but apparently they haven't been working. That's been the main problem there, um, but we're not, we're, we're like nerds, we're data nerds. We don't really know much about how uh, chemistry, so I don't want to, to say that I'm an expert on this at all. A question about, you said you're a data nerd. The, the company that chose not to use your data, what do you think they thought? Ooh. <laughs> well, this, this is, there's a... Because that's the lesson here about data use. Yeah. It's right yeah. in front of them. That's a good question. They had, there were like uh, community outreach meetings where they answered questions and they said that they were aware of the model, but that they, uh, they, they have been mum actually about what they thought. So it's hard, it's hard really to know. Um, there's some journalism, journalists working on this, I guess I could say right now, but. There, uh, there was a lot of finger pointing. Yeah, well. Uh, after uh, this Not occurred. our wheelhouse. Um, <laughs> and we didn't, we have speculations as to what exactly happened, but. To make an interesting point, it wasn't the city of Flint's money to spend. It was money mostly coming from the outside. So oftentimes when it's not your own money, you don't spend it incredibly efficiently. Um, so I'll make that as a high level point, but we don't know exactly what happened. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm curious about the actual process, if you know, that went into the installation of the pipes in the first place and what, if any, sort of policy decisions or practices were in place that made this modelable and, and what variables ended up being predictive of where we're Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, so we, we, can, we have a breakdown in some of our other papers about which uh, features are most important for prediction. Um, uh, parts of the pipe installation process are unknown to history. Some of the homes in Flint are over 100 years old. Um, but there are things that we do know. For example, the year the house was built is highly important because lead plumbing was illegal after 1978 or something. But there's also other, I mean, it's not just on off there. There's also, there was a lead shortage during World War II and also a construction boom. So if your house was like in the sweet spot of time when, uh, when houses were built in Flint, then you're less likely, even though you have an older house, to have a lead pipe. And then there's other features like uh, how valuable the homes were and things like this as well. Um, but yeah, we can, if you want, I can point you to our papers and we can uh, give you a better breakdown of that. Yes. Yeah, very quickly, did you use information about main pipes and are main pipes a concern? Uh, Mains no. generally aren't made out of lead. So main pipe, So just to be clear, main pipes are the pipes that go down the street, which uh, bring the water to homes. But 
um, they tend to not be, you, you tend to use a, a, a more solid material for those pipes. These uh, service lines have to snake around roots and trees and things, so they tend to use softer material. So lead was a good was a good idea back in the in you know in the 1930s and 40s, um, but but uh, you know they stopped using lead pipes for that. You, you, you know, uh, in, in so you know you don't see very many lead pipes being used in Flint at least in after the 1950s or 60s. Um, well, I'm wondering what the end game is. Like, at the more sites you select, the lower the probability of each marginal additional site. So where yeah. do you stop? Do you think does the running, money run out, or do you have some threshold below which? You yeah, that's a, well, it's a question of prioritization, right? So we want to make sure we are spending the money as efficiently as possible, uh, and we want to put ourselves out of business, so to speak, right? Uh, as we remove pipes, the number of lead pipes is uh, decreasing, and it's harder to find them. So. Um, the end game, eventually, ideally, would be to visit every single home and make sure um, that if you don't have enough money to do that, you have to decide what order you do that in, right. I guess. At that point, then, the cost per dig winds up going yeah, back it goes, up Yeah, it goes to infinity as you go to zero on the hit rate. So I think, uh, yeah. So I'm curious, where's the data in your predictive models from? Like, how did you c collect all those data? Because it's a good question. Quickly, 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 we got parcel data from the city of Flint, which includes how old the properties are, how valuable they are. You know, just tax information about, about the property, uh, census data. Census about data, the home. yeah. Uh, uh, water testing data. Water testing data, records that we got from the city. So they, what records had, even though they weren't, that, they were predictive, even though they didn't necessarily have the yeah. correct answers on them. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much Thank for your so time. Much.